took on this mammoth task of looking at the disparity, but also saying, um, you know, when you look at the impact of COVID-19, there are some social determinants of health, whether you're talking about housing, whether you're talking about environmental challenges, whether you're talking about employment, the inability of some uh, individuals who work to shelter in place and the high impact of unemployment on the black community, or whether you're talking about the impact of education or the impact in small businesses. And we need to look at those social determinants of health. And as we are developing solutions to take into account the disparate impact that COVID-19 is having in the black community and to look at uh, those policies that we are putting in place, to look at those solutions that we're putting in place with this information in mind. Yeah, and I think David, I think me that there was a question in the audience on this one kind of related to uh, some of the digital equity that you had mentioned. Yes. Sure, uh, the, uh, the question that's come in from our audience member is uh, yesterday, President Preckwinkle announced she is forming the Council on Digital Equity. What can you tell us about that? Well, I saw that announcement by President Preckwinkle, and I think it's a recognition that um, not only have we seen health disparities and employment and housing and all of these other areas, we have seen a real divide uh, or a heightened understanding of the digital divide. And, you know, even if you have a uh, Chromebook to bring home as a student, you have to have a level of connectivity that will allow you to engage in classes that will allow you to interact with your teachers. And so I believe that President Preckwinkle has said, we want to uh, not only gauge the level of this divide, but we also want to stand up solutions so that our students, we don't know long, how long they will be out of class, but we don't want that to become an additional barrier to their achievement. And so I want to commend um, our president, our, our Cook County Board president on that work. And uh, I know that she and the mayor and the governor are all working together to minimize the barriers that are being created as a result of this disease. Yeah, and, and I know the, the Urban League focuses a lot on youth, focuses a lot on businesses and things of that nature. Again, after all of this pandemic hit, I know the Urban League was, was quick to start and implement the COVID-19 Community Health Center. Can you talk a little bit about those programs that kind of stemmed from that, but also from the, the Urban League as a whole? Absolutely. And so we have uh, for over 100 years been working in the areas of small business development, housing, education, um, employment. But as we saw this pandemic unveil and the impact it had on the Black community, we said, what if we are able to focus our work in our traditional areas, but also to focus this work with a COVID-19 lens. And so as an example, when businesses were trying to access the uh, PPP money that was coming from the federal government, when they were uh, working to access the loans and the help that were, was coming from both the state and local government, we were able to walk them through the process to answer questions that they may have had. And then we were also honored to serve as one of the agencies that was administering the mayor's uh, grant program, the $5,000 in grant money that has gone to 1,000 businesses throughout the city. But in addition to that, uh, we are able to provide uh, support for individuals who are looking for employment. Yesterday, we uh, partnered with Operation Push to provide names of individuals to uh, work on their testing sites that they are working in partnership to set up throughout the community. And so we know that there are two phases, both the urgent phase 
uh, what can you do now? How can you help now? We know that uh, there will be an uptick in mortgage foreclosures and evictions. We have our housing center that can help in that regard. But we also know that there will be a need for long-term recovery support and we're prepared to engage in that. And all of that is being done through our community, uh, our COVID-19 Community Health Center. So it's work that we're already doing, but it's also uh, doing that work with a special emphasis on the uh, support that is available for COVID-19. Mm -hmm. And you had mentioned a little uh, earlier about partnership with Mayor Lightfoot and the grant programs there. Um, interested, you know, it, it's her first term as mayor. It's your first, uh, you know, new into this role. How have you worked with the mayor's office on this? It seems like a lot of the initiatives that the Urban League is promoting, the mayor is also uh, kind of working on in Best Southwest and things of that nature. How's that relationship? So that, re that relationship is good. I initially uh, met the mayor when she was coming in and as I was going out. And uh, interestingly, uh, she now chairs the Criminal and Social Justice Committee of the U.S. Conference of Mayors. Uh, when I was going out, I said to uh, President Steve Benjamin, who was the president at the time, I think Mayor Lightfoot would be a great chairperson for this committee. And so now she chairs that committee. But even before I started my tenure at the Urban League, I thought it was important to understand what the city's agenda was. And so I came and not only sat with the mayor, but many of her department heads. And as a result, we're able to uh, coordinate a lot of the work that we are doing with what the city is doing, both in the small business sector, with the housing sector, and uh, with education and youth serving programs. Uh, so there is a good relationship and um, we understand uh, the role that the city has been playing with uh, assisting or addressing the divide that we see, the, the sort of uh, sense that there are the haves and have nots. And, you know, I am excited about their efforts to address poverty, but it's not just the city, uh, it's the county, it's the state, and it's also the private sector and foundations that have said, we understand that there are folks who are achieving and doing well in Chicago, but we also are keenly aware that there are people who are not, and we want to be a part of that team of folks uh, that are addressing those folks who need assistance, who need that extra support. That's great. Dave, I see you came off mic. Is there another question from the audience? Yes, uh, we, we've had a few good questions submitted. Uh, let me begin with this one. One of our audience members asks, uh, how can our work on jobs and skills training pivot from the needs of employers and around full employment pre-COVID to equitable recovery in these times? What, what opportunities exist, for example, contra contact tracing jobs, which are desperately needed uh, for us to restore the uh, functioning society? Uh, those kinds of opportunities that might lead to sustainable career pathways. Do you see some opportunities there for the Urban League? I, I think that there are tremendous opportunities there for the, other, for the Urban League and many other organizations. In fact, there is a group of us uh, that, uh, that formed the CBOE, and this was in uh, place long before I got in, but we've begun to look at those areas where we know that even though folks are losing jobs, there will be uh, employees needed. And contract, contact tracing is something that is extremely important, but can be done without a lot of skills, uh, or at least not a lot of education, because it is simply a process of, of deduction. And so we believe that training uh, can be offered to contract tax tracers. It's better to have contact tracers from the community because there's an element of trust that is inherent in folks from the community. But also, as we look 
to uh, Congress and the federal government to uh, stand up support for cities and states. We know that there is yet another bill that is in front of Congress. And even though they don't expect to pass something prior to the May recess or the uh, Memorial Day recess, we know that there will be uh, a bill that will target support of cities. And it is very likely that that support in cities will focus on infrastructure because that's something uh, that during my tenure as, as a leader with the National League of Cities, we worked hard to get passed. It didn't happen, but we see an opportunity now uh, from the city standpoint to support infrastructure. So we believe that um, as employment organizations, we have to look at how we can get uh, individuals who are unemployed, who are underemployed into those high paying jobs. And it, it's not just working in unions, it's not just uh, laying seamen uh, and, and working as an operator engineer operating engineer, although those areas are important. It's great to get folks into apprenticeship and pre-apprenticeship programs, but we also think about infrastructure as the development of parks. We know that there's a lot of work that needs to be done with parks. We also know that there's an opportunity in uh, those environmentally friendly programs. For instance, at the League, we have a solar program that's important. We also know that um, as there is work to deconstruct and uh, demolish uh, substandard housing, substandard buildings, but also to rehab vacant buildings like schools. So we are very hopeful that with the work that is going on with the federal government, with the additional support that will be given to cities, that you will see uh, almost a WPA-like program that will be able to uh, help those individuals who are un unemployed, at both as a result of COVID-19 and who were unemployed long before COVID-19 to get into the job sector, not just now, but they will be able to continue uh, to engage in the job, uh, in jobs. Well, thank you very much. That uh, great response. Let me let me get to the next question that's that's come in from our audience members, uh, and this this person asked: Before COVID nineteen dominated everything, uh, what was your agenda in Springfield, and has it changed? I'm I'm sort of paraphrasing here. Uh, is your approach right now to the legislative part of your job? more focused on working with the General Assembly in Springfield, or is it more federal in terms of programming support? Well, what I would say, it, it's both. Uh, it's all of the above. It's Springfield. It's uh, the federal government, and that's largely through the National Urban League, but it's also uh, working with local government. And here's the thing. Uh, prior to the onset of COVID-19, the focus was much the same. It was on employment and workforce development. It was on the development of small businesses in the Black community. It was on the work that we do with housing and financial empowerment and education. I think uh, it was on the work that we do with research and policy. I think what you will find uh, now that COVID-19 has really impacted our community in such a tremendous way is that we now are underscoring the importance of the census. We were uh, working on a census. In fact, we were supposed to be a census center where people could come in and fill out the census form. We're hoping that as the economy and as um, the city opens back up, we'll still be able to do that work but what COVID-19 has done is emphasize the importance of the work that we were already engaged in with Springfield as it related to the census and the other needs in terms of workforce development and the other areas that um, have been focused on in Springfield. But it also provides an opportunity to address with intensity, 
the underlying issues that we have seen that have simply heightened the disparities that we've already seen both at the city and in the state? Well, uh, Madam uh, President, that's absolutely a, a wonderful response. And it leads me to ask you, I'm, I'm going to now telegraph in advance. I'm about to ask you a softball question here, okay? I'll take it. <laughs> here's, here's the softball question. The COVID-19 pandemic has ripped off the bandage or ripped, ripped apart the curtain that has shown us in stark relief the disparities that exist in American society uh, concerning educational opportunities, employment opportunities, housing opportunities, every other kind of opportunity that you can imagine that has been denied in equitable fashion to the Black and Latino communities of this country. Now that we have seen this in such stark relief, it is an embarrassment to the United States to have these kinds of inequities exist among the different sectors of our uh, population. What can we do or what should Americans be taking away from this crisis? And do you think that the COVID-19 crisis is in any way going to serve as a wake up call to Americans that we need to address some of these fundamental inequities and uh, you know, get our act together once and for all. That is certainly my hope. Um, it has absolutely ripped off the Band-Aid and uh, shown how much disparity exists, uh, disparities uh, exist in our country, in our community, in our city. And um, I am very, very hopeful because at heart I'm an optimist that this will allow us not to just uh, replace the Band-Aid, right? To just, um, you know, say, okay, well, we're going to give um, one-time stimulus payments or we're going to uh, do those things that will exist for a short amount of time. But I am very hopeful that this will change the way that we do business. I've already seen it happening both at the city, the state, of uh, the federal level, but it's also been happening in the private sector. As we have talked to those who support us in the corporate community, they have said to us that they are rethinking their strategies. We have seen the Chicago Community Trust a uh, focus on um, the wealth divide that exists in our city. And I think that increasingly, we will see foundations, we will see corporations, we will see community-based organizations like the Urban League that are focused intensely on reducing the divide and the poverty that we see so that when the next pandemic comes, and we certainly don't want to see anything that is as bad or as, um, as devastating as COVID-19, but we know from history that there will be something else that will challenge our community and we won't see the disparities that we've seen with the pandemic of COVID-19. Well, thank you. There's a couple of questions uh, that have come in regarding voting and we're all thinking about November of 2020 and how oh, that certainly. is going to work out. And to combine these two, we have a couple of audience members who've, who've asked, uh, the pandemic presents a heightened danger to black and brown communities, so much so that voting in person may not be feasible for many. What is the Chicago Urban League doing to support local and national voting by mail efforts? Well, we certainly uh, support a voting by mail option, uh, both locally and nationally. We have been a part of those discussions at the national level. I heard President Preckwinkle say yesterday that they are looking at the options that are available and we would certainly encourage uh, both uh, at the Cook County level, but also at the state election board level, the um, importance of making it easy and safe for people to vote. And, and certainly we have seen that one of the ways that's most easily to do that is through voting by mail. Uh, we saw what happened in Wisconsin. We have seen uh, a heightened incidence of, of COVID-19, uh, both the disease and death that 
was attributable to requiring people to go to the poll, but not just um, the danger from a health standpoint, but also the fact that it impacts your ability to exercise your ballot when you have to make a decision and say, well, I'm not gonna vote, I'm gonna stay home. Uh, we know that by advertising early, by making a vote by mail option available, by making same day registration available, uh, all of those things help people to participate in a process that we have all come to understand to be very sacred and uh, that we all know uh, certainly this November to be extremely important. And I know that my colleague Warren has another question to pose, but speaking of voting, I wanted to mention very quickly, the Public Affairs Committee of the Union League Club had a presentation yesterday by Marie Dillon of the Better Government Association about a vote by mail initiative that they are working on with Rainbow Push and reform for Illinois. And basically the idea is to mail to every registered voter a ballot, not an application for a ballot, but a straightforward ballot so that in the event that they can't get to a physical polling place, everyone will have an opportunity to be able to, to vote. Um, at, just to be sure that we take that, that, that step. But um, anyways, that's just to follow up on your comments. But Lauren, I think you had some other things you wanted to ask uh, the president about. I just yeah. want to say that the Urban League wholly supports that initiative. It is extremely important. But Lauren, uh, your next question. No, I, this has been a great conversation. And just watching our time, I want to make sure to pivot to another topic that has been important to the Urban League for years. I know that typically they've been involved in the selection process of the new superintendents in the city of Chicago. And you obviously are serving on the National Police Foundation Board of Directors would love your insight on kind of how that process went, you know, the communication that you might have had with Superintendent Brown so far and what you're hoping to see, you know, under new leadership, the, the gun violence and social justice reform in the city. We certainly um, were appreciated the opportunity to weigh in uh, with the process, uh, both through uh, the initial selection and as um, Superintendent Brown was ultimately selected. Uh, I think he is a great candidate and, um, and, you know, look forward. I worked with him during my tenure with the U.S. Conference of Mayors when he was down in Dallas um, and so know his leadership very well, have watched and admired it. Uh, there's no question that he is, um, he is coming into a challenge. Uh, the level of violence that we've seen, and certainly it has gone down, uh, largely because uh, folks have been required to shelter in place, but it's still uh, at a level that no one in the community wants to see. And so I think that uh, as community members, we have a responsibility to work in partnership with the police department. At the same time as uh, community voices, we have the responsibility to ensure that uh, the police department is responsive to the needs of the community. What I have always said, I said this during my tenure as a mayor, and I uh, certainly will uh, say this as my, uh, with my tenure with the Urban League, is that the community certainly wants to be police. We want to be police constitutionally. And everything that I've seen about Mayor Lightfoot, about Superintendent Brown, is that they have every intention of doing so. I'm happy to hear that. I, I, I like having some hope and in a long process of uncertainty in a city that we're going to move forward in a positive step. Absolutely. In addition to moving forward in a positive step for the police reform, I know you have also been tasked or appointed to the task force by the mayor of Chicago to be leading the um, mental and emotional health group with Evelyn Diaz, who is the president of the Heartland Alliance and Alexa James, the executive director on the National Alliance on Mental Illness Chicago. Obviously what we're going through right now is having a large impact on mental health what has the task force been up to thus far? And what, what do you kind of forecast for what they're gonna be releasing? 
Well, it is certainly an honor to uh, serve at the appointment uh, and at the request of the mayor. And uh, I've also enjoyed serving with Evelyn and Alexa uh, because they have uh, led their organizations much longer than I have and, and with, great, um, with great skill. Uh, what we've uh, worked to do is really establish the fact that we have all as a community, as a collective community suffered from the trauma associated with this disease. Um, the fact that every day we're seeing a body count um, from COVID-19 and the fact that we're seeing numbers amass of people who have contracted the disease. Uh, we're sheltering in place and certainly we're having more of an opportunity to enjoy our families, but we have been separated from our friends, both from the folks that we work with every day and uh, people that we would come into contact on a regular basis in our community. But even um, the fact that some of our older relatives have been separated from us, uh, you know, we know that grandparents don't care much about children when they have grandchildren. And so they've not been able to see grandchildren as much as a safety factor, both to them as uh, those who are at risk, but also as a safety factor to young people. All of that has been traumatic. And so we have looked uh, at those who have uh, been at acute risk. Uh, for either suicide or increased substance abuse or uh, the increase that we've seen in domestic violence. But we've also uh, looked at the fact that there are those who have just been anxious, have suffered from anxiety and depression. And how do you address that? Sometimes it's through the clinical process. Sometimes it's through uh, the community organizations we've come that we've come to know and love like the faith community like the connections that we have in fraternal and other communities uh kpet is uh one of the um examples of community organizations that can provide an outlet for its members and so we have been emphasizing that through our work with the committee and uh are preparing to deliver a report to the mayor and to the overall uh, task force that is actionable and that will be a service to the citizens of this community. Well, and you mentioned, obviously this having a big impact on the youth of today who might not entirely know how to deal with this situation. I know the Urban League has historically had a fantastic youth program group and, and it sounds like you guys are continuing that despite being yes. Like, what, what's, what have they been doing? So we have maintained contact with our young people through Zoom. Uh, we have a partnership with the Lyric Opera that we are excited about. And our uh, young people have continued in that partnership. But we also have a Center for Student Development and a Human Capital Department that supports students and their parents and their families. And so Zoom has been uh, the tool of choice in doing that. I wanna give a shout out to all of our 2020 graduates uh, because we know that uh, many of our students are graduating this year. They have made plans to uh, go to college and we know that it's been extremely difficult for them and others who have not had an opportunity to celebrate proms and graduations in the traditional sense. But, you know, we want them to know it's like an accomplishment, just the same. We are so proud of them and we are looking forward to them as they take the next steps to college, through uh, employment, to the military and other areas as they uh, prepare to move on. And we've even had some of our students who have graduated from college and we want to salute them as well. Mm -hmm. We have a couple of other questions that have come in and I wanna combine a couple of these. One is really a combination question and praise for you, Madam President. Uh, 
this audience member says, first, I wanna thank you for all that you do to represent and serve our community. I have always been inspired by the work of the Chicago Urban League, which leads to my second point, which is the question of how can the community help support your efforts? So think about that. And then a specific question uh, regarding housing. Uh, this person asks, as someone with a background in housing issues, how do you see COVID-19 affecting urban and low income housing policy in the long term? So a thank you for your service. What can we do to support your efforts? And what specifically do you see going on in the housing space? Well, um, we knew, uh, first and foremost, let me say thank you. Uh, it is an honor to serve and um, it's something that's really a part of my DNA from my parents. But um, what I really want to uh, address the question as it relates to housing, prior to COVID-19, we saw that um, the reins were being tightening, uh, tightened in terms of mortgages and that uh, there was a prediction that there would be uh, another housing crisis. Uh, now that we are facing the pandemic, we do see uh, significant challenges around housing. We know that people have been unable to pay their mortgages. And while a number of companies are attempting to be uh, more lenient towards their payment process and towards the uh, grace periods, we know that they have already started foreclosure proceedings. And so that's where we believe that at the Urban League, there can be uh, help in counseling people who may be forced with uh, or faced with foreclosure and um, in other actions by mortgage companies. When you talk about people wanting to volunteer and help, one of the things that we are doing through the Help Center is um, accepting volunteers, both uh, through coaching small businesses, through financial coaches, through educational tutors, because we know that students who continue in education will need tutors. And, um, and that can all be done virtually. That's the great news about um, of, uh, an opportunity. And so we would encourage people to call us at 773-285-5800. We would encourage people to go onto our website at shyul.org, both to get help, but to offer assistance because we, uh, what I've seen, and, and I've really been encouraged by this, and Dave, you and Lauren may have seen it as well, there is an increase in uh, really people who want to volunteer, who want to support others who have had a harder time during the pandemic, and we certainly want to be a conduit, a convener of people who are willing to provide that help. Well, that's outstanding. Uh, we're, we're getting toward the end of our time, but I did have a, a couple of other quick questions from our audience that I wanted to wrap up with and pose, if I may. One is, uh, can you share with us your assessment of what's known as the gig economy, people who go from one gig to another on the black and brown communities and the urban leagues response to that? And the other question is a little bit more specific, and it asks, with your experience as a mayor, and a conduit of the National Urban League in your current position, what is your take on the effectiveness of the Federal Opportunity Zone program? Maybe we could start with the latter question. Uh, tell us your thoughts on the Opportunity Zone program, and then maybe some quick reflections on the gig economy as it affects the black and brown communities. You know, uh, those are both great questions. Uh, in fact, your audience has uh, offered some phenomenal questions. The first thing that I would say um, about the Opportunity Zone legislation uh, or provision in the tax legislation was that it was a hidden gem. And, um, you know, I found out about it very early after the Tax Act was passed, and some of us were very concerned about the Act. But when I saw that, I uh, communicated with the governor of Indiana, because that's where I was then, to say, we need to make sure that this works for communities across the state. Um, I think that to the extent that 
those opportunity zones were placed in neighborhoods that were challenged, but where there could be an attraction of investment, you've seen them work well. Um, I know that in Chicago, they've been placed in some of the neighborhoods with the most challenges. I think the, uh, the concern there is that there has to be um, a carrot, if you will, an opportunity for people uh, who are in the equity funding uh, business to invest in those communities. And I think that's why you may not have seen as much investment as, uh, as was anticipated by the enactment of the Opportunity Zone. Uh, and you see that not just in Chicago, but in communities all across the country. What we have with the COVID-19 pandemic and the investment that will occur as a, relate, as a result of it is the opportunity to couple uh, that new investment with the Opportunity Zone incentive to really see the opportunity zones live up to the billing that was given when they were first unveiled. Um, as it relates to the gig economy, um, I think it has, um, the, it, it has been a double-edged sword. I think that it has certainly been an opportunity for uh, individuals in the black and brown communities to get jobs, to support their families, to uh, do those things that uh, come as a result of being um, in, employed by uh, Uber and Lyft and um, you know, some of the Grubhub and uh, DoorDash and some of the other uh, entities that have led the gig economy. I think you always have to watch the the fact that you know it's you're in many places uh in most instances an independent contractor and i think that's where organizations like the urban league the women's small business organization uh others come in because we are able to um advise individuals who have engaged in the gig economy in a way that it works for them, that it works for their families. I know that uh, the mayor and the governor have said, you know, we don't want to make uh, the fees so prohibitive that people aren't able to make a living with the gig economy. And so I think that when you work in partnership with those organizations uh, that provide those opportunities, that is when you see the re best results. And certainly we've worked to do that at the league. We've worked to do that uh, through the National League of Cities. In fact, last October, I testified before Congress about uh, transportation companies like that, uh, that have been a part of the gig economy. And I'm hoping to work with them to ensure that this provides the opportunities that they say that it will provide and that it is not another barrier to uh, supporting families. Well, uh, Karen, I appreciate your time today. And I know that the Urban League is always a resource for those that are looking to get engaged on conversations on racial equity and COVID-19 responses and things of that nature. Uh, Want to end on a positive note because I know it's a little crazy. So do you have any, you know, things that you've found inspirational or good news for everyone to kind of go out today? Well, you know, the thing that I would offer as good news is that the more this has, uh, this pandemic has impacted us as a community, the more we have come together, whether it's people who are volunteering for the food bank, or whether it's people who are volunteering by giving out masks, I think this has really strengthened our resolve as a community. The last thing that I would say is stay safe, uh, stay at home, and when you can't stay at home, be sure to wear your mask because it really is a matter of life and death. 
I agree 100% on all of those accords. I wanna again, thank everyone for joining us today for our second virtual program, given the, the recent uh, health orders, we are gonna be continuing virtual programming for the foreseeable future. So please check out our new website, uh, follow us on social media to stay tuned for what's next. Uh, again, Karen Freeman Wilson, appreciate your time today. Look forward to seeing all that you do with the Urban League and look forward to seeing you at another KPEG event in the future. Thank you both so much for having me. It has been a pleasure. And thanks to the members of the audience who took the time to tune in. Well, we, we definitely appreciate that. On behalf of the Union League Club of Chicago, I want to thank uh, uh, our KPAG president and my colleagues at KPAG for giving us this opportunity to partner uh, with them to present this conversation. We've covered a lot of ground. And uh, Madam President, you have a lot on your plate. Uh, but I, I can say that we all feel that the Chicago Urban League and the communities that are served by the league are in very good hands with your leadership. And we thank you for what you're doing to try and make our region a better place and more equitable for all. So thank you, ma'am. Thank you so much. It's an honor. All right. Take care, everyone. Take okay. care. Take care. Have a good weekend. Yes. <laughs>